mitigation and uh, climate change policy. So we have four presentations in this session, and uh, we allocate 30 minutes for each presentation, including uh, Q&A session. So uh, we will start with the first presentation very soon, and uh, we would have a time control for each presentation. Uh, originally, we have a co-chair person, but uh, he was called to <laughs> the Asian Council meeting, so he cannot come. And we will uh, do the chairing by me only, and I'm mailing Ling. And the first presentation will be by Mr. Chen Mianming. Um, he's currently the senior technical specialist from the Central Geological Survey, and they have been paying a lot of effort on developing all sorts of uh, geohazard potential map, and it is a very uh, rare chance that we can invite them to share with us the experience. So uh, please, thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, uh, by uh, uh, Professor Ling. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor uh, to uh, represent Central Geological Survey uh, to share the topic on the evolution and the prospect of landslide hazard investigation before and after Typhoon Morak. Uh, it would be easier to explain my speech outline through the timeline. I'm going to show the history uh, of the ways to investigate landslide. There are three key moments. Uh, first of all, in early 1990s, 1990s uh, the, uh, with massive development on slope land, uh, such as uh, residential community and the infrastructure as uh, economic uh, blooming. The second, after GG earthquake, 1999, there was a uh, more typhoon attack Taiwan. And uh, from 3.7, uh, 3.3 to 5.7 typhoon uh, landing per year after 2000. Uh, at that time, the, uh, also the beginning of awareness uh, that uh, forced the government to pay more attention to the geological hazard. The last is after the severe disaster, uh, Typhoon Morak, 2009. Continued, continued the investigation for several years. The purpose, uh, for the purpose of rebuilding and uh, relocating the village and the infrastructures. It is also the important, the most important moment for the remarkable progress uh, of the landslide investigation technology by applying airborne LIDAR. So I will follow this timeline to introduce my presentation. So I'm going to talk about more detailed evolution of each time interval. In the early 1990s, uh, government uh, agents took aerial photographs, as you can see here, on plane the scheduled. We, uh, to establish the basic imagery of our country and uh, produce the topographic map. Another way was to purchase more expensive foreign commercial satellite images, landsat and spot mostly. After that, we identify landslide uh, with uh, visual recognition, uh, the naked eyes or stereoscope, and if we conduct a wide range, uh, wide range survey, we will utilize NDVI, uh, uh, NDVI algorithm to accomplish the landslide inventories. The point is, uh, for the landslide just happened, there were no vegetation on the, surf, uh, on the landslide area. This is also the concept 
of using NDVI algorithm to identify landslide. Uh, when we considering the need for the land development and uh, utilization, Central Geologic Survey uh, start a project which deal with engineering, geological survey, uh, and exploration on slope land community of Taiwan. Uh, we have uh, produced three kinds of map uh, in the early 90s. They are slope analysis map. and uh, uh, regional geological map and combine these two maps into the uh, development advice map. Later, in early 2000s, we combine geological, uh, geological data with the Hiroshima map to further output four kinds of uh, thematic map, uh, includes Lithological assemblage map and the rock mass strength map and uh, uh, environmental geological map. Finally, uh, there is also a landslide sustainability map. Each map could be applied to different purpose in different fields. Uh, we are going to move on the next stage. After GGS quake 1999, at that time, we realized that keeping constructing landslide inventory is uh, definitely important. Because before the arrival of millennium, the violent shaking of GGS quake in central Taiwan uh, fractured the rock mass in the mountain area. Therefore, reducing the slope stability. Furthermore, the extreme weather has become routine phenomena since GGS quake in 1999. I don't know why, but just happened. I have mentioned from 3.3 to 5.7 typhoon landing per year. So uh, Taiwan also launched self-government uh, uh, for more two number two uh, at that time. Uh, uh, in 2005, uh, timely. Uh, so the wide range hazard survey can be conducted flexibly and uh, environment changes uh, can be seen from satellite images before and after the hazard event. So with the help of computer technology, and uh, the digitalization of area photograph and the, the advantage of self-government satellite uh, make us easy to construct the multi-temporal, multi-temporal landslide inventory, especially before and after specific rainfall or uh, earthquake events. This is not a uh, Different. Uh, this is not a difficult matter, but it's a matter of spending time for sure. So this case shows the environment changes before and after Typhoon Monarch. The left is before Typhoon Monarch, and the right is uh, after Typhoon Monarch. You can see the landslide took place in the affected area, especially from the, uh, especially. Uh, the southern Taiwan, especially southern Taiwan and, uh, and the, to the central Taiwan, uh, it is uh, well uh, uh, correlated with the rainfall distribution in that event. By using uh, mentioned the landslide inventory, we can establish the hazard classification. What does that mean? Uh, we based on those multi-temporal landslide in inventory between 1980 to 2050, we have calculated the duration of landslide existence at each site in whole Taiwan. 
The longer the duration of landslide existence, the worse the geological condition. We can apply this information to prevent important infrastructure or mountain settlement are located in such those potential hazard areas. Moreover, we experimentally apply several representative landslide inventory to training a landslide model, a landslide susceptibility model, and then try to predict which slope unit tend to reach higher warning signal for evacuation purpose. At a third important moment, known as uh, Typhoon Morak 2009, we launched a six-year airborne LIDAR mapping project to accomplish nationwide one meter in one uh, uh, nationwide DEM and the DSM in one meter resolution. Moreover, there are four uh, value-added product include water body polygon, multi-directional hill shape map, slope map, and the, the LiDAR DEM quality map. Based on LiDAR property of uh, without refraction point cloud on water surface, uh, and uh, we also refer the area photo to delineate the water body polygons. And uh, the hill shade and the uh, slope uh, function is, uh, uh, they are both uh, popular function in any GIS software. So the multi-directional hill shade map and the uh, slope map, the, those two maps are the most useful application for the geological survey. And finally, the LiDAR DEM quality map uh, indicates the ground point crown hollows with colored spot, meaning different transmittance of LiDAR. So it means that the darker the color, the lower reliability of LiDAR data. So what could LiDAR DEM actually do? Well, LiDAR DEM has the benefit to remove all the covering, the, uh, all the covering of the ground surface. The cover means the non-ground point crown. We can delete the non-ground point crown to, uh, to, uh, attain, uh, to gain the, the, the true ground. So the LiDAR DEM can reveal details about the topographic changes just like the difference between the plane covered uh, area photo and the, the, the plane stripped uh, DEM. Uh, you, uh, you can see the subsidence at the cen center of the, the right DEM. Uh, it shows us a series of concentric scalp. A series of concentric scalp. So on the contrary, it is, it is hard to detect it, the subsidence by using the, uh, the area photograph. So this is why we keep identification potential landslide. Mostly shows uh, deep-seated gravitational slope deformation, especially uh, focus in the vicinity of mountain uh, settlements and uh, important uh, outreach role or uh, infrastructure after Typhoon Morak 2009 uh, for the sake of uh, re detecting a potential hazard area. As I mentioned, all kinds of data, uh, you may be wondered where, where I can get them. Uh, since uh, the awareness of open data and the right for people to know the environment where we live, Central Geological Survey collect all the existing environmental geological information into cloud architectural database. It uh, includes the annual inventory of landslide uh, or uh, 
the the landslide inventory from different uh, image source or in different color. Or for example, the 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 red color and the yellow color are uh, interpreted from different image uh, source. Uh, one may be satellite, satellite and another is uh, aerial photo. And the uh, uh, potential large scale landslide in, in blue color. We also uh, collect the cataclysmal slope, known as a deep slope. There are several kinds of a visual base map to enhance the spatial distribution with a, a stereo effect, include the geological map and the here shape map, slow map, uh, and the multi-temporal uh, satellite images. Those data are uh, gathered into the uh, uh, cloud system uh, named landslide cloud. In addition to the mentioned wide range landslide inv investigation technology, through the use of aerial photograph, satellite, and the LIDAR, etc., to establish a database of landslide nationwide, we have explored and introduced a more detailed landslide investigation technique at a specific site, such as surface displacement analysis conducted by remote sensing like a uh, radar image, uh, UAV photograph, or by GPS, RTK, uh, and even uh, ground-based LIDAR. Uh, we also detect underground by uh, in kinometry casing, shape acceleration array, SAA, time domain reflectometry, TDR, and the extensometry, and the water label a meter, etc. Uh, furthermore, we even try to use uh, sens sensorometry to monitor seismic response around a stable slope. Those new techniques are used to observe the slope instability uh, for, uh, for the assessment of uh, further uh, mitigation. When the Typhoon Maggie attacked the northeastern coast cliff in 2010, result in Suao Hualien Highway uh, was interrupted and the 26 casualties who were passing the road was was washed by debris flow uh, into the sea, unfortunately. Because of this tragedy, uh, the legislation of the Geo Geology Act or you can see, you can call it a geological law, law of geology. The, the geological act was passed by announcement of a geological sensitive area, and then regulating then development must uh, conduct a geological survey and a safety assessment in advance. After that, proposing uh, the the countermeasure uh, to cope with the geological sensitive characteristic of the developed area uh, for the purpose of disaster prevention and uh, mitigation. So let's, uh, let's uh, go back to our topic. Uh, uh, each disaster event happened, they will cause a revolution in our way of uh, landslide investigation. And uh, Central Geological Survey conduct a mission of large-scale landslide identification in regional scale, but focus on settlement, uh, vital outreach role, and the infrastructure, as I mentioned before. However, the government only have a, a limited uh, benefit, a budget, uh, only have limited budget. And uh, the follow-up implementation of disaster prevention will focus on establish multi-observation and the safety management operation for specific, uh, specific large-scale landslide. 
So the transition from wide range survey to uh, specific specific landslide monitoring and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, it's like a prevention uh, and observation uh, depends on the hazard grading and uh, uh, risk assessment to select the the target site. Another evolution is that in the past, the way we uh, do uh, we conduct the landslide investigation, we always survey from visual recognition of aerial photograph and the satellite images, and then investigate on site right after the the disaster happened for the possible uh, mechanism and the cause. But uh, after the Typhoon Monarch 2009, through the application of LiDAR DEM, Central uh, Geological Survey can detect the potential large scale landslide uh, with gravitational deformation characteristic before the disaster occurred. But, uh, the, but the, the number of uh, potential large scale landslide uh, very very huge, very huge number. So consequently, it is uh, necessary to uh, develop a feasible and a reasonable method for assessment of the potential large-scale landslide. But at the current uh, at the current stage, we suggest that uh, they rely on expert to determine the key qualitative and the grading criteria for classification of potential large-scale landslide and uh, evaluate them by expert judgment. This is because the topographic and the geological condition of each potential landslide and the la natural condition such as hydrology is unique, are unique. Uh, in other words, case by case or site by site. There, is, uh, there will be no two uh, individual potential large-scale landslide with the same uh, nature condition. Uh, in addition, uh, there are not so much cases uh, occurred. And uh, it, it seems like it is not feasible to evaluate it by statistical me method. Another point must be considered is that the larger the area of landslide, the lower the probability of occurrence. And uh, it is uh, hard to remediate from the perspective of uh, disaster prevention, or not to mention insufficient budget. In, but in recent years, Central Geological Survey has paid more attention to the potential media scale landslide. The media scale landslide with higher probability of occurrence than large scale and the possibility of remediation. They, uh, it will be more match the need for disaster prevention so the potential media scale landslide may exist in independently or be part of be part of a potential large scale landslide so the first uh, the last uh, the last slide uh, while well, I will talk about a prospect uh, since the central geologic survey originally apply remote sensing Im images, many satellite images and the image pair of aerial photo to study landslide is for nearly two decades. And uh, gradually involved into the LiDAR DM and then UAV LiDAR. But at the present time, the UAV LiDAR the background of this map uh, was uh, the point cloud of, uh, of uh, aerial uh, airborne LiDAR DM. The, the, 
the UAV LiDAR is a still experimental project for, construct, for considering the safety of valuable LiDAR instruments and uh, a main aerial vehicle. So it's a very expensive and precious toys. Oh. So uh, uh, at the present time, is, uh, it, it is also a, it's still an experiment project. But uh, especially in the mountainous area, but uh, it is not a, it it's not suitable for wide range survey, but a good option, a good option for specific slope unit. So therefore, each technique has its its limitation, depending on the u the user how to use them in the right place. And, and uh, this is taken from Nancy Jiao, the southwest of Taipei Basin and the backyard of uh, Central Geological Survey. And uh, you can look Taipei 101 over there. So welcome to visit us and uh, wish you have a nice trip in Taiwan. So thank, thanks for your attention. Thank you. I think we have time maybe for one question. Yeah, when you assess the landslide, how do you define your large scale landslide and the mid medium scale landslide? What's the difference uh, or how do you define it? Uh, <laughs> It's very simple. We uh, we classify the large scale one and the middle scale one uh, use the the area more than ten hectare a hectare uh, uh, classify as a large scale one uh, ten hectare and uh, more than uh, and the volume more than more than ten one hundred thousand cubic meter. But the more, uh, but they they have uh, the same uh, uh, criteria. It must have a deep seated. But uh, recent year we found out uh, some of our result. Uh, uh, recent years uh, project, uh, um, some of them, some of the large scale landslide uh, could be uh, um, could be uh, some. Uh, Asian landslide, uh, but there is no uh, material on the slope. It only the the remain of the landslide scarp. So, uh, in the future, we uh, uh, so we uh, we uh, our uh, perspective was uh, uh, we hope to uh, in the next step we hope to. Uh, develop a, a classification uh, method to uh, classify uh, those large scale landslides. Thank you for your question. Uh, can I ask that uh, what's your definition for the medium size? <laughs> Smaller than 10, <laughs> 10 hectare landslide, but oh, I have a, a deep seat. Uh, that deep uh, have a deep sea, uh, deep sea landslide, and they also has the feature, the the topographic feature in in the ground surface and uh, interpreted by the lidar DEM. Yeah. But, um, because uh, currently, uh, in some definition, the deep sea landslide means that the um, side of surface situated inside the rock body. Uh, I, I don't have uh, the answer, <laughs> sorry.
Are we ready to have that? Thank you for research from Kata. Yeah, totally. Cause, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, no. Has been uh, working on this uh, disaster reduction center for a long time, and the disaster reduction center actually served as a supporting agency for hazard management during the emergency operating center operating. Operating center. We got EOC. Earthquake, and flood. Many other yes. Yeah. So uh, they have developed this uh, smart system and has been coming to aid to many government agencies and also local governments. They also use that a lot during this uh, EOC operating period of time. So uh, he's going to give us an introduction on that subject. So let's welcome Wei Zheng. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ling. Uh, believe me or not, my office title is very, very hard to pronounce in both English and Chinese. It also costs me a lot of time to remember the full title of my office. It's not your fault, it's my office fault. So today I am honored to have the chance to talk about the smart emergency preparedness and the disaster risk management in Taiwan. That's all the two, two big topic, but I try to mention about synergies, very important thing. How we have a synergy in Taiwan among all government agents, even about private sector, and also including how we make most use of information, scenario, but catch the trend of the world. Also talking about big data and open data. Uh, of course, I think everyone is fully aware in Taiwan we are facing a lot of different challenges from nature hazard. One of the example happened 10 years ago after Typhoon Morocco. I think everyone knows about more than 700 people died after the event. By the way, Typhoon, Flood, the brief for landslide are kind of the, our friends happen every year. But another big challenge to us, just like earthquake. This year also the 20th anniversary of Chich earthquake which hit us 20 years ago and claimed Live losses about 2.5 thousand. So we must remember we have the facing kind of challenge day by day. But however, most important thing, Taiwan we based on a lot of economic export. So we must think about our economic activity exposure to nature hazard. It's a report conducted by the uh, uh, insurance company based in London in 2014 identify Taiwan is number three around the world if we consider about its economic activity exposure to nature hazard. So it's our destiny, it's our job for both research community and disaster management. Think about how we enhance our resilience. So the same company actually in 2013 also have a report talking about social economic resilience, especially focus on mitigate, propel, and respond. In that report, you see, Taiwan, Japan, and South Korea, we are both listed at low risk. For the previous one, see, extreme level. But talking about resilience, we can be listed at low risk. I summarize some factor that we could be listed at low risk. The first of all, application of science and technology. My office, National Science and Technology Center for Disaster Reduction, pay attention to our title. We skip one word, research, because we had NTU had a lot of good universities. They are good at the research. So NCDR focus is not on research. We focus on implementation. And very important, we kind of bridge to connect practitioner and researcher as the good environment from the supply to demand, we can work together. So that's a very important thing, synergy in Taiwan, especially about science and technology. Second thing, transparent risk. For the previous speaker, we talked about a lot of risk. Actually, in Taiwan, we open almost all kinds of risk to our general public, including flood, the brief floods, earthquake, even soil liquefaction. You just type your address, you can find any risk surrounding by you, and most important thing about legal framework, like many countries around the world, only after big event, we think about use law to guide disaster risk management. Our case, because of earthquake, hit us in 1999. So we think about our society need the law to guide everything. So in the year of 2000, though we had a presidential election, but 
our society still pass the very important law that guide our disaster risk management till now. However, Mother Nature always texts us again and again. In the 2009, we are challenged by another big disaster, Typhoon Morocco. So we had a new amendment to our law. So about disaster management, always the learning process. We're learning every new thing from every experience. So that is a good word for disaster management. First, learn from disaster. Second thing, live with nature hazard. But another very important factor in Taiwan about active participation by private sector. Like Professor Ling and other professors, they are devoted themselves into disaster risk management after, teachers, after many, many events. They try to find the root cause, try to help our society for more resilience. And most important thing, my office role, how we pro provide a kind of smart way about disaster risk management. Actually, my office tried to play the role on the chart. First, we still find science and technology, but we know sometimes the reports are very scientific. It's not good for decision maker for the general public. So our role, you try to transform those technology terms into understandable knowledge. But another important thing, we need a good speaker to speak at different audience, like my director, Professor Chen, he is a good speaker. He can use his, his influence on decision maker. Or like my other colleague, they speak as group grassroots level, talk to people in community. So we need people good at interpretation to, to do what? To change people's mindset, to risk and enhance their risk perception. With that process, when they need to do anything for right, they can take right action. So that's the full process from science and technology, from real knowledge, from mindset, and important action. So in our society, we hope try to empower the capacity and capacity when and how especially conduct kind of DR life cycle to build up resilience. So that is the model in Taiwan, how we work together to improve technology for disaster risk management. In Taiwan, of course, investment is a very important thing. Wherever we want to improve disaster risk management, we need investment. But before we do anything, actually we have set some improvement. Like we have collaboration with the Water Resource Agency, with the Soil Water Conservation Bureau. Before we start any mission-oriented project, we must set up what kind of improvement we want to do in coming three or four years. That's important process. So in between, we have a lot of I, innovation, information, integration, interaction, and implementation. Implementation is the most important thing for my office and other partner to do. We never want to just publish some papers. We want to do something together. So in the last few years, actually, for a typhoon earthquake, through kind of good teamwork with a lot of partner with NCDR, first about a typhoon. Actually, in Taiwan right now, we have a very good mechanism to share and exchange information. No matter when something happens, even right now, nothing happens, we still maintain good information exchange. And second thing, impact assessment-based preparedness. We know we are not a guard. We need to accommodate a lot of uncertainty. So right now for an emergency operation, we try to have impact assessment first, identify disaster hotspot, and very important thing, early evacuation. We try to reduce the casualty. So when I saw the news about the recent event in Japan, you know, as a disaster manager, we always try to think, when is a good time we can make the people safe, to make them go to the safe shelter. And for earthquake, we emphasize some pre-disaster pre preparedness plan and earthquake early warning system. I will tell you when we move to the ICT parts. And this is about my office. My office actually, first, a uh, very important thing, we are not a government servant. We just government hire disaster manager, but under the Ministry of Science and Technology. So very important thing, our job is focused on science and technology. Second thing, look at background of my colleagues, very diverse. Because when we try to solve any issue related to disaster, we need a lot of the interdisciplinary collaboration. So in my office, we connect all kind of the uh, background. And very important thing, my office focuses on providing services. So all services in my office, no matter to government sector or to the private, free. We never ever charge any cent from our end users. And we have a lot of partner, no matter in Taiwan or in the international society. We try to have more friends together work on disaster risk reduction. And this is the recent model actually in Taiwan. 
from technology scenario risk and evaluation. Most important thing, from science and technology development and innovation to enhance decision making process. Of course, in my office, we work with a lot of prominent university. We have a lot of models to predict some influence by potential nature hazard, but no perfect model. We know models always have limitation. So in recent years, we include a lot of real-time monitoring, like contribution by soil and water conservation bureau, and also from the uh, geological survey bureau, and also from the water resource agent. We collect a lot of real-time data to fit and to calibrate our prediction, and also a lot of real-time CCTV, so we can monitor what is happening. So help us revise our result, but also have the limit. Limit the number of sensors, cameras, and the transmission quality, also the big issue during the event. So we need the last step, operation and decision. So in recent year, NCDR, we work with our partner in the Central Emergency Operating Center, try to use try to bring a lot of scientific result into real decision to lower the casualty. So this is a model that will work together. And why information is so important in Taiwan back to 10 years ago when Typhoon Marco hit us, it teach us a lot of things about information. First, too much or too little information. Too much means at that time, Along the low-lying area with the flooded area, they still have power and telecommunication. We receive a lot of posts from internet about their situation. But in some really isolated area, like in mountainous, we cannot reach them, both by roads or both by telecommunication. And at that time, we had too many systems. So it's very hard for decision maker to understand situation just by one pictures. So my office received one mission is to build a system of system to integrate all information to fit demanded oriented pictures. So this is the first, first thing we learned. Second thing, lack of common operating pictures. Because without the same platform, we might discuss the same thing but speak different story. So we received a job to implement a common operating picture from central government to all the 22 local governments. So right now, all 20 local government and central government Using our information system, of course, we have support from many partners to feed information to my office. And last one, help to make a timely operation. That is very important. We call it digital emergency propellant through a lot of ICT propellant. So this is the model right now I described in Taiwan. I call it kind of end to one and one to many. Why is it end to one? We receive a lot of input from different government agencies I mentioned before. But very important thing, come to one body, like in EOC, we work with a lot of partners. We try to have a unified body to digest the data, to produce information intelligence based on our user. But what is meant end to end? By this end could be represent a rain gauge data. But this end could be the citizen or a mayor at the local government. Though they, don't, they all want information from rain gauge, but information intelligence are different. For a citizen, maybe just want to know flood or not, to go where. But for a mayor, he want to know how many people he have to deploy, by when and where. So the same information from the rain gauge, but we had to produce based on our users. But the most important thing, use multiple channel to cover our end user. So ICT is important, why? Because early warning system and deliver the system to deliver the early warning all depend on ICT. Especially, they can enhance the risk understanding through kind of systematic approach. So that is a very important part. Why we have impressed ICT, but we also consider another factor. Who send or get a message from ICT? Like five years ago, 10 years ago, only one direction, government sending information to the end user, they have to follow or listen to. But nowadays, we all have cell phone, we all have internet, it's the two-way communication. So we have to think about how we get or send information through ICT. So I will tell how we improve the, the environment. Last thing, what kind of action to take, that is called information intelligence. Based on the message we send to the end user, what kind of action they need to take, so that is show how Taiwan have good synergy on information in integration for disaster risk management. Like my office is kind of a miracle because the good synergy represents 
whole Taiwan function as one provide information. My office received 400 big data set from 40 government agency, free and real time. We do appreciate all effort by our, from our partner to help to build out a system. But our goal is not to have data, not to have database. We emphasize action and uh, application. We don't want data just the data, just for research. We want to bring out application and action that we can save someone in, at a very urgent moment. This is the typical idea about our web page. We call it common operating picture for oral society. Inside the, our web page, we use the big pictures, no matter GIS picture or pictures or any other kind of picture. Try to tell a good story because the, our director, director Chen Hongyu, believe only picture tell a good story. So we prepare good pictures, short text description, and real time data. But you might ask, the question could be so many, how you provide answer to everyone? We prepare a lot of bookmarks here. What is a bookmark? Kind of dialogue with our end users, emerging responder. We find their demands and we prepare a bookmark for them. They just press the bookmark, they will find their solutions. Why we use a bookmark? Why not ask the emerging responder to use the ArcGIS to make their own plan? I know that is too lousy because most of them are afraid of kind of the using a lot of the operation to produce a map. Our original version is that one, but we realize it's not a good one. So currently we provide a lot of bookmark, continuous dialogue without any use to understand. What include our model? A lot of the information like the path prediction of a typhoon, warning, torrential rain, uh, rain gauge data, even focus about uh, a flood. But most important thing, we try to accommodate some um, certainty of weather prediction. You see, typhoon might go this way, this way, or this way. Of course, we are not in charge of weather forecasts, but we try to accommodate those uncertainties. So when we produce kind of report, we will include maybe two or three scenarios, give a time and space for preparation. So this is how we use science and technology to accommodate some uncertainty. And to tell a good story, we always combine GIS real-time real -time data, and this one we combine three kind of different real-time data. First one is rain gauge data in high, high mountain area, including intensity and total rainfall. The second thing is at the, the middle string of the river basin, we use the rain uh, router level gauge data to identify the water level under the bridge, and we also use CCTV to tell about what's happening in upstream area. Try to make use about all information we have use a very comprehensive and integrated way to demonstrate situation. Likewise, even along the highway, we use the rain for data and the CCTV to explain why we have to close the roads. And about information, first, we create a kind of open data platform. Right now, every agency in Taiwan, no matter central or local government, when they try to publish alert, they must follow common alerting protocol. And the first collaboration, we collaborate with Google. We send information to Google so people can get information from Google from the 2013. You see, in the last three years, after 2003, it's three years because a lot of typhoon events. You see, so many users receive information from Google. Why with Google? Because first, public-private partnership. Second thing, we save a lot of bandwidth. No government agency able to maintain big win with that so many users want to get data at the same moment. Third thing, we don't have trained people how to use Google Crisis Map because everyone knows about how to use the Google Map. Another improvement, we call it cell broadcast cell phone. Cell broadcast services, we try to send all alert here through my office, we set up cell broadcast entity and send to the mobile phone company so you will receive alert. So in the coming day, if you are lucky enough, you will see pop out on your cell phone and ring, that means an earthquake is coming. And third one, to embrace the real information society. In my office from last year, we have used a line, operate one official channel. From the last March, right now, we have 1.07 million users follow our line. We push the information, we push the location-based information to them. But what are the inf improvements? This is one example we have collaboration with the Zhonghua Telecom Company. Mm, I cannot play, okay. 
This is about dynamic distribution of mobile phone user. We can use this to identify distribution pattern of population. So right now, since the two years collaboration, right now they can improve very good result. Every 10 minutes, one data set. The spatial resolution is 500 meter by 500 meter and covers whole time one. So like right now, one earthquake happened, we can know about population distribution 10 minutes ago. This is about ICT part. About disaster renewal part, actually my office also play a very unique role. This is uh, EOC, Central Emergency Operating Center. In the EOC, actually, uh, the direct chain lead a group, we call it Situation Assessment Group. This is a real picture. He was talking to Premier and the Minister of Interior, use our information system to enhance their risk understanding and take action. Even when our president should visit the EOC, direct chain also have to give her a briefing about the situation. This is very real case around the world, how scientists help decision-making process. On the other hand, my colleague also joined some grassroots level to help community-based disaster risk reduction. And in your EOC, actually, NCDR is the leader of one group here. And in the group, actually, we have a lot of partners. NCDR, Water Resource Agency, National Fire Agency, Highway Bureau, Solar Weather Council Bureau, Central Weather Bureau. We try to work together, try to do what? This is the obvious case. Use science and technology, we try to identify wind damage, storm surge, floods, landslide or mudslide, especially when, where, scope and scale and scope of impact. For what? Like the army disp dispatch some personnel to possibly affect the area or help for early evacuation like water resource agency. They will deploy the pumping station in possibly inundated area. So this is a step in my office. When we receive typhoon is coming from phase one, phase two, phase three, from the activation, pre-disaster preparedness, emergency response, quick recovery, each phase we emphasize different product. Like activation, we emphasize about risk. What kind of risk we have this typhoon? From the pre disaster preparedness, we try to emphasize impact. Emergency response, we emphasize situation, then we provide map and quick survey. This is one case of typhoon in typhoon uh, Nisad in uh, two years ago. We try to accommodate here, very diverse prediction. So first we give some the wind impact this is high risk area. And most important thing about the rainfall, we divide into three phases. Three phases, approaching, landfall, and living. So we provide a kind of information with time and spatial information for deploying some resources to reduce possible impact. So even we have the model to estimate storm surge. And the most important thing, we give information about flood based on different stage. And this is how we use kind of information for early evacuation. This is historical data. This is the observed data. This is numerical results. For this case, we found in the early morning of the August 29th, it will be reached the threshold value, but it's not could evacuate people at the midnight. Our criteria for early vacation, daytime, arranged transportation. So we moved to the previous day in the afternoon to do the vacation. What kind of possible effect we can have, like this one. This is one event because Water and Conservation Bureau have some training in the community. So even the acute rainfall was very little, only about 10, 10, 10 millimeters, but they decide to live their community. So this is a perfect case. From science and technology put into imitation, we save the 32 residents because of early evacuation. About earthquake, how we respond to earthquake? Earthquake always hit us without any precaution. This is one case happened in 2006 in early morning, but we have a system can produce kind of the map immediately. Because what? Because we have the uh, population distribution map, and we also have a lot of scenario before, based on what kind of information we want to deliver, we have collect information. Because in my office, we had a grid system, 500 meter by 500 meter. In the grid, we include a lot of vulnerability. We ever want to do simulation, or we have the real uh, authorization, we can do the risk in, in, uh, investment immediately. So this is our goal, our suggestion for the uh, earthquake 
uh, earthquake risk reduction first about old housing. Second thing, support and safety to citizens. Last one is functional uh, uh, continuity in our society. And almost reach the last few slides of mine. This is my experience from the 2004 when I joined NCDI. At that time, I described its experience-based operation. Only emerging responders take lead, took lead in EOC. We use very traditional tools to do emerging response, do something only during and afterwards. But since NCDI and other school professors join, they realize science and technology plus data make a difference about disaster risk management. But it's only about size base. So we use a lot of digital map, use a lot of early warning evacuation. Yes, we do something before. Now, I think it's phase three. We focus on information intelligence. We had more element like general public also join. And the most important thing, we focus on preparedness. And the last slide uh, is the kind of remind for everyone here, because we are all disaster manager. First of all, black swan event means low frequency but high impact. How we correctly address kind of black swan event to our society as risk communication way, that's a very important thing. Second thing, think about our society, not built yesterday. Some part of, of our city may, might be built maybe 50 or even 60 years ago. The aging infrastructure always be the future problem when we have disaster. The last part, I call it the generation gap of disastrous reduction. Why? What is this? Like my daughter, when Jesus earthquake hit, he was just two years old. Right now, he is fourth grade in the university. My daughter and her classmate know little, remember little about Jesus earthquake. But however, people in Taiwan, we must have something like a Jesus earthquake, maybe one time or two times in our lifespan. But to us, we must pass kind of knowledge to our next generation. No matter when next the Chich earthquake hit to my daughter generation, they have learned from the ground zero. It's new experience for them. So this is very important thing. We must bridge the generation gap of disastrous reduction knowledge. So thank you very much. This is my presentation. Thank you. Of course, of course, we follow the same different word for disaster risk reduction. <laughs> we not just follow, we also translate into Chinese because the, the version uh, delivered by UN Na United Nations is not fit our society because some terminology to us is uh, very strange. So my office, we translate word by word, sentence by sentence into Chinese version. So, and we also have a lot of meeting focused on how we further implement the same framework. So we do follow the framework. We had policy suggestion about how we further implement the Sendai framework. But however, unluckily, we cannot measure by the United Nations because we are not the member, state member to. Yeah, I think it's in the annual report. Yeah. But however, uh, a lot of friends from UN, when they visit our system, they think, okay, Taiwan is quite above the every standard. Actually, uh, we exchange with uh, experts from Japan for the earthquake responses. We fully agree Japan is number one around the world. But talking about typhoon and flood, Japan agree. In Taiwan, we had done every best try to reduce casualty. They even think we can be the model to Japan about response to typhoon and relative disaster, especially, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. yeah, a learning process. So, so that is, we fully apply a lot of international uh, principles for a disaster risk reduction.
Actually, we also have a collaboration with Ciji, the biggest uh, charity foundation in Taiwan, NGO in Taiwan, with Information Exchange. They can receive information to help their vulnerable household. I think that's just a good trend. Even a, a scientific uh, institution, we should collaborate with NGO to increase our influence and receive bilateral, in, uh, bilateral information from Information Exchange. Thank you very much, Professor Lin. Uh, my name is Samuel. I'm from the Soil and Water Conservation Bureau. So today I'm going to share some experiences we deal with the debris flow disasters in the past decades. So this picture shows the tropical cyclone frequencies. Uh, as we can see that the dark red represents the high frequency of the tropical cyclone. Here we call typhoons. So Taiwan is here, so we are prone to uh, typhoon disasters and the following related disasters. So uh, in the previous uh, speakers, they talk about the Gigi earthquake. So if we take a look at the historic severe typhoon events in our history, there's a very big separation. So during the Gigi earthquake in 1999, before that, typhoon usually brings floods. But after that, not only floods, but uh, a landslide debris flow occur because those kind of uh, big shake will loosen the mountain uh, geological structures, especially in central part of Taiwan. So here are some pictures and a video uh, of the debris flow disasters caused by different typhoon events. As you can see from the video, uh, the debris flow occurred in central part of Taiwan, the Senmu village, we call the hometown of debris flows. Uh, after it was televised to the public, people here aware of the severity of debris flow disasters. So here the picture is another debris flow disasters and uh, photoed by the unmanned aerial vehicle, uh, which occurred in uh, 2011, southern part of Taiwan by Typhoon uh, Namado. So it's easy to um, uh, separate the debris flow into three parts. For the upstream areas where shallow landslide usually occurred and generate a lot of debris materials, and those materials just mixtured with the water by the torrential rain caused by typhoon or, or the rainfall and uh, initiate the debris flows. So when debris flow coming down through the channel, uh, which has strong erosive ability because it contains a lot of boulders and couples and pebbles inside. So after debris flows, the channel will become deeper and wider usually. So to the downstream areas, we focus on this area because a mild slope, it will deposit in a fan shape. So we also call the fan areas. A lot of research has been done uh, throughout those fan areas because people usually live in the downstream areas. So we also call it affected area because this kind of sediments will affect our daily life. So um, this slide shows the framework how we deal with the debris flow risk management. So usually when we are doing the hazard assessment, like the, uh, Dr. Lee talked about, we ask ourselves, ourselves three questions. Where, when, and how big? So where are the debris flows? According to the previous investigation, more than 10 years, we have more than 1,700 we call 
potential debris flow creeks, which means those creeks are prone to debris flow disasters. So each creek has the downstream affected fan areas. So uh, those affected areas reveals the scale or the run out of the debris flows. Uh, Prof Professor Lin helped us to uh, simulate using different models those kind of runouts. And very important thing is that every year before the flood season, which starts from May in Taiwan, we work with the local governments, try to establish the inventory of the people name list who live in those uh, downstream fan areas. So those people are, our, are the targets we want to protect So during the emergency. So traditionally, we use a lot of engineering constructions to prevent uh, debris flow from happening, such as check them, slay them, permeable them, every kind of them. But they will cost a lot of time and money. So recently, the government just turned to the software, especially after the uh, Typhoon Morocco in 2009. We draw some uh, restriction of the land use. Uh, for example, the specific areas, or we relocate uh, the people who live in the dangerous areas, but people will protest against that. So it's not so easy. So uh, recently, the government can do is to do the evacuation during the emergency. So if we want to evacuate people from the dangerous areas, we have to know when the disaster will come. So a reliable early warning system is very important. So look, let's go back to the first thing. Uh, where is the debris flows? So Professor Lin from, uh, and he, her group from Taiwan University, we worked together to zoning those areas of the potential debris flow creeks. So two kinds of indexes we considered. First one is occurrence degree. The other one is the protected targets. So the occurrence degree usually means the geological and hydrological conditions. For example, the watershed area, landslide ratios, we give them the ratings. Uh, another one is the protected targets, which usually means the buildings, infrastructures in the downstream uh, fan affected areas. So we use the, this kind of um, risk matrix to leveling different uh, risk of the uh, potential debris flow creeks, which is very important for us to tr distribute our budget in the next year. So for each uh, creek, we have to set up those kind of evacuation route map, like this one, for people to know where to go during the emergency. We also work with the uh, military, so we do a lot of drills uh, before the flood season for them to get acquainted with those kind of routes and the shelters. For the main parts of the early warning system, uh, in Taiwan, we use the rainfall criteria. So we call it localized rainfall-based uh, warning models. Two indexes of the rainfall we use. One is the rainfall intensity. The other is the effective accumulated rainfall. Uh, we use the word effective, which means not only the real-time 24 hours accumulated rainfall, but we consider the preceding rainfall for seven days, which, uh, like we can say that the content, the water content in the soil, which plays a very important role about the collapse of the slope. So uh, we put all those kind of uh, historic events, including uh, especially including the debris flow events into the statistic analysis and choose the 70 probability line. As you can see, the dotted red line uh, as the critical line and uh, to set up those kind of rainfall-based model. We, we have two indexes, but for the public, it's not easy to understand uh, the rainfall intensity concept. So we just try to simplify it into one uh, index, which is the accumulated rainfall. So different places has different uh, rainfall criteria, which differ from 250 to 600 millimeters. So uh, we got two stages of this kind of warnings. 
when the predict rainfall, which come from the Central Weather Bureau, also from the NCDR, then uh, in a certain area, it's over the threshold, say 300 millimeters. Then we issue the yellow warning for, for persuasive evacuation. If the real rainfall is over the threshold in certain area, then we issue the red warning for mandatory evacuation. So during the emergency, not only in the Central Emergency Operation Center, in our bureau, we also have a, a established the Emergency Operation Task Force in our center. So we receive uh, over 500 uh, on-site automatic rain gauges and refresh every 10 minutes about those kind of rainfall data. We have a web-based decision-making system to issue the debris flow warnings. We use every possible channels, including the Dr. Lee talked about the public warning system, which use the uh, cell broadcast technology and deliver those kind of uh, uh, very important messages, including the debris flow, earthquake, torrential rain, etc. And uh, the much faster than the traditional uh, cell phone uh, messages. So another thing is that recently we think that rely on, only rely on those uh, automatic rain gauge is not enough. So we work with the uh, Central Weather Bureau, NOAA from US, as well as the Water Resources Agency. We work together to develop the QP sum system, which is radar derived rainfall. So the shortcoming of the rain gauge is like this one. Sometimes the rain gauge is too far away from the debris flow sites. So we just rely on the rain gauge data is not enough. The precision is low. So we use those kind of QP sum system. The special resolution is the grid. So the grid resol resolution is 1.3 cross 1.3 kilometers. And the refresh also every 10 minutes. So it just supplied better uh, spatial resolution and make our warnings more accurate. So another thing is that uh, the warning model is just based on the rainfall criteria and the uh, statistics of the events. So catching those uh, uh, on-site debris flow events is a very important task. So from 2002, the Bureau has tried to develop the on-site debris flow monitoring system, including the fixed one, mobile one, and portable one, which we can carry on our back in the mountain uh, areas. So all the information just uh, transmitted through the satellite to our Bureau, the headquarters in the central part of Taiwan, and uh, we just put it on the website, also the apps uh, to the public. So different kinds of sensors we use, including the cameras, uh, like the cameras. Those kind of camera information just integrated in the system from the NCDR. Also the water level meter, rain gauge, uh, and wire sensor, which is most widely used sensors in the world. When debris flow comes, cut it off, then we got the debris flow occurrence signals. And geophone is to detect the ground vibrations generated by the debris flows, like the earthquake. So here we can see the pictures. This is the um, debris flow events in central part of Taiwan, 2014. So we got two wires. When debris flow comes, cut off. Then we, we, from the cell phone, we got the debris flow occurrence signals. Also, uh, we can uh, analyze the frames of the videos, and uh, the front search velocity is 4.9 meters per second. I remember that Professor Lin do, did a lot of research in this area, Senmu village. Five, yes. So we also have the rainfall patterns upstream and downstream, uh, and uh, we see some boulders inside. So those kind of boulders hit the channel bed and usually will generate elastic waves it can be detected also by the geophone as well as the seismometer. And we do some spectral analysis. Amazingly, we find out seismometer has better detection ability than the traditional geophone we use. So those data is very important and feedback to our rainfall-based model. And uh, 
this picture, I want to tell you a story about the origin, how, why we established the disaster resistant communities. So in 2004, it's the second year we started from those kind of uh, evacuation and early warning system. Most of the people in mountain areas won't go. If we, we just issue the warnings, but they don't believe that, usually. So in this case, uh, amazingly, we find out uh, two gullies, uh, we have the debris flows, and uh, about 60 houses were buried, especially in, in these areas, in central part of Taiwan, but we amazingly, we only find one casualties. So then we go back to the history. What we have been done in the previous, about the preparedness works in this area, amazingly, uh, about two months ago, we have a pilot studies. We sent some um, uh, specialists. Uh, Dr. Chen is also, now he's working in NCDR. He's one of co-workers of Dr. Lee. Now, at that time, he's a postdoc, I think, in, in Zhongxin University. So he's leading a group of people just go there to distribute those kind of simplified rain gauge to the local people. The lady is the, uh, no, the boss of the grocery store. So the lady learned some knowledge about debris flow disaster prevention and put the, uh, the rain gauge in front of the grocery store. So every customer, when they go there to buy things, they are curious about what's that. So the, the, the boss just tell them, oh, that's the uh, simplified rain gauge. We can take the measurements of the rainfall ourselves. And when the rainfall is over a certain threshold, then we should go. Otherwise, the debris flow will come, it will kill you, something like that. So the ladies educate the customer every day for two months. So everyone is be, has been educated by the ladies. So after two months, the real debris flow comes. People receive the warning by the government, and most of them will be evacuated by the governments. So after that, the year 2005, we initiate uh, a project. The first one is we try to hire the local people. Not hire, because they are the specialists. They are the volunteer. We don't pay them. They just willing to do that. So uh, we, we give them the training, give them the uh, simplified rain gauge, so teach them the knowledge about the rain flow prevention, something like that. They take the measurements using the simplified rain gauge. So so far we have about 3,000. Uh, we call it debris flow volunteer specialists all around Taiwan. So let's let me remind you that the potential debris flow creek is, is about 1,700. So the coverage of the volunteer specialists almost 100%. Of Taiwan. So every village has at least one volunteer specialist. So this is the training courses, uh, teaching them how to use the simplified rain gauge, use the VR to sense the debris flow circumstances. We also borrow some techniques from the Kyoto University, Japan, to, to give them the training about the preparedness knowledge, something like that. Very important thing is that those people are the seeds of the, their communities. When they go back to their communities, they will affect their families, affect their neighbors. So transfer their neighbors and their communities into a disaster resistant communities. Those people will be divided into different groups. For example, if we belong to the shelter groups, so when we receive the sea warning uh, of, the, of the typhoons issued by the Central Weather Bureau, uh, the group of the shelter just go to the shelter to open it, to prepare everything about, for example, the water, uh, the food, uh, even the sleeping bag, something like that. So every, everyone has their work to do during the emergency. So this kind of community well-trained, we call disaster-resistant communities. So during the Typhoon Morak in 2009, we heard previous talk, uh, speaker talk about Typhoon Morak. 
So we issued 21 debris flow warnings almost all Taiwan. And uh, uh, from statistics, over 9,000 people were evacuated by the debris flow uh, warnings. And uh, after that, we do an entire investigation of the uh, areas uh, uh, affected by the debris flow and landslide. Over 1,000 people escaped from the possible casualties. So this kind of mechanism has been proved effective. So this is the video like the Dr. Lee talked about. In fact, uh, this video is recorded by a firefighters. So during uh, 2015 in northern part of Taiwan, when debris flow comes, so uh, the firefighter recorded the debris flow coming down to the village. So this is a typical fan areas of the debris flow in the downstream areas. So after that, I personal just went there to took the picture. 15 houses were buried by the debris flow and 47 or residents just evacuated beforehand, so no one got hurt. So if we just see the detail of the timeline of the warnings, the, the, uh, the resident even carry on the autonomous evacuation before we issue the yellow warnings. And then the, uh, the, the another thing is that I have to say that the reflow come in the morning, 7.45, but we give them issue the red warning at five o'clock. Imagine if you are the village head within three hours in the morning at five o'clock. Is it possible you evacuated all the villagers within three hours? I think it's, it's not easy to do that. At least we have to, we have, to uh, we have some statistic. Evacuation of a whole community takes about at least six hours. So autonomous evacuation, especially carry on by the resident themselves, is very important. So the key factor of this kind of successful evacuation is this person. So this person, Mr. Wang, is village head. So I took the picture after the disasters. I just do the, I did the interview for four hours after that. I I'll go there. Uh, this is his wife and two uh, sons. They are working in other cities and go back to help uh, to, to do things in, the, in their families. So Mr. Wang is one of our volunteer specialists. And also this community has been one of our disaster resistant communities. After training, I can say that this community has become the resilient communities. So uh, we have a statistic. Uh, let's take a look at the red line, which represents the number of the casualty and the wounded by the debris flow versus by the whole typhoon events. So it's getting lower and lower, which means those kind of early warning evacuation system has been uh, very effective, especially uh, when People just has knowledge and they, they are willing to do the evacuation activities during the emergencies. And uh, this year, uh, uh, I'm very uh, glad that uh, we have some cooperation between uh, Southeast Asian countries. The first one is Vietnam. Uh, this bridge between Taiwan and Vietnam is constructed by Professor Lin. He gave me a phone call, then I made a phone call. And also, uh, uh, we just visited Vietnam. We signed the MOU in 2017. And those people in Vietnam, those specialists, think that the, uh, the on-site debris flow monitoring station is very important. So this year, the next month, we are going, we are going to go to Vietnam because the first uh, Taiwan, Vietnam, collaborative monitoring demonstration site will be fulfilled. So uh, I hope that in the future we can still expand this kind of uh, demonstration site to other places in Vietnam. Also every year we hold uh, a lot of uh, uh, activities. Like this year we have the Asian Pacific Disaster Management Summit. And after that we have the resist 
resistance uh, policy dialogue between different countries, including the Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, and Myanmar. So specialists from other countries come to Taiwan. We just work together to solve the, our uh, common problems, uh, to, to get acquainted with each other, how we can cooperate in the future. So just last month, we have the uh, Taiwan Southeast Asian Countries International Conference on Slobland Disaster Prevention. Uh, and uh, different specialists from different countries, we just get together because uh, now the Taiwan government has new southbound policies. So we just put our Slobland disaster mitigation uh, targets on this kind of policies, try to uh, exchange, try to share our experiences of the debris flow disasters. We have been done for almost 20 years. So the last part I want to show you is that this year uh, in April, we attended uh, the Geospatial World Forum in Netherlands. And uh, we won the 2019 Geospatial World Excellence Awards. This is the only country uh, to won this award about the disaster prevention um, aspects. So the last part during the ceremony, we have a 40 second videos. Uh, I want to show you at the end of my talk. Okay, this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have time, maybe yes. one question. <laughs> uh, I've, been, uh, I've been told I have to keep to very strict timeline, so. Can I invite you to Malaysia? Sure, <laughs> if you like. So you have talked a lot about evacuation. Yes. So how about the build? Once you have evacuated those people, and those people need to come back to the, come back to the home. Yes, sure, and sure. how about the rebuild? Once you rebuild, do you need any prevent, preventive measures? Like you need to build those rigid barriers, flexible barriers, and check dams. So you cannot avoid this problem. This is you all. I guess you need always in engineer. Measures. Yes. So this why probably we are looking forward to your 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 builder's new achievement. In addition to those yeah, early thank you very much. System. Yeah. So uh, no engineering construction is very important. In fact, uh, uh, our background is engineer. So we we did a lot of engineering uh, design and check dams, permeable dams, every dams. We do hundreds, thousands of dams in Taiwan, especially in mountain areas. Uh, when we build the dams, there's a, it's a kind of dilemma because you see, uh, if in the villages we build the dams, people see the dam, they feel safe. So if we, if we issue the warnings for the government, they won't go because there's a giant dam beside them. So they won't go. So it's kind of, uh, we have to educate them. The dam is not 100% safe. They are not able to protect you if the, uh, no, the scale of the disaster is over the limitation of the dam. So it's very important. So education is very important, I think. I can uh, make some comments that uh, we, they do have this uh, code for, uh, yes. code for building them and also uh, manual 
for engineers. So uh, there are actually codes and manuals for engineers. And then uh, there have been some discussion also, there have been uh, environmental issues that uh, some of these uh, NGO uh, lead group, they don't like to have the breeze control them because no. they think that you're destroying the uh, natural habitat for some of these uh, um, animals. Sure. And then uh, uh, there being a case um, in one of the debris flow stream that they, they actually didn't build that because they observed these uh, uh, special species of animal were uh, living in uh, hab the habitat is nearby. So there been some discussion and dilemma. And also uh, we have been talking about this, uh, uh, also of this uh, mitigation engineering facility sometimes will provide a false sense of security. <laughs> Because usually what we have been capable to do is to, using this type of the engineering structure, you probably only be mitigate a small to medium size uh, scale of this uh, uh, hazard. But if you want to build a bigger one, it's not very economic. It's, you become very expensive. But then you have to try to educate the local people that uh, when it's time to leave, <laughs> You really need to go. <laughs> yeah. But you said that when after you have a massive debris flow, the whole ecosystem will be also be destroyed. I mean, the whole uh, uh, usually the dam filled up very quickly. No, no, even if you don't have the dam, okay? I mean, the debris flow, you also destroy the aquatic life also. So I mean, so how 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 is the arguments of this uh, what are called the environmentalists? I mean, if you have a check them, maybe have a series of check them, probably it's still safe. But if you don't have it, still coming down, then everything they destroy. They're your 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 aquatic life, all gone. The check them actually still help uh, quite a bit, but uh, then there will be still you need to have this uh, emergency evacuation drilling all the time and then uh, try to educate that. And I think that is a uh, very successful case, but still in that debris flow tolerant, they, they did build some dams, but they were filled up very quickly. So uh, uh, in addition to this mitigation uh, facility, you still need to have this sort of this uh, drilling and information system and education of the people. I think the very important thing is that because I discussed with those kind of issues with the specialists from Japan, they think from the engineering concept, safety is the most important thing. So when they are building some dams, uh, safety should, should be the first priorities. So other kinds, other things is that local people usually lack them. They lack like dams. But uh, those people about environmental protection, they don't like cement. So, <laughs> so controversial problem usually occur in, in the meetings, especially in those tribes or in mountain villages. Actually, it's the ring nets they use in Switzerland. So, yeah. But very expensive. Uh, the thing is that once it's filled up, it becomes very difficult to um, maintain. No, actually, you need to maintain that. You need yeah, to, but, you know. But those types are more difficult to maintain than the concrete built one. We don't have to try those before. Okay. We, uh, sorry, maybe later on because uh, we need to move on to the <laughs> next one. <laughs> um, because the uh, center closed down 5.30, so they say you have to keep to the time. Uh, uh, let's move on to the next presentation uh, will be given by Dr. Wang Yifong. Um, Dr. Wang is now the Deputy Director General of Water Resource Agency. Huh? Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, I'll do it later together, yeah.
And uh, Water Resource Agency is the uh, main agency that's uh, in charge of from flood <laughs> to water resource to uh, ground subsidence. So they are also one of the agents, government agency doing all sort of this uh, hazard mitigation. So uh, that's welcome. Uh, he's going to talk about ground subsidence t today. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you, uh, Professor Lin and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, time. Time a uh, little delay, but don't worry, I will finish on time. <laughs> okay, uh, today uh, I'm so glad to have this opportunity to, uh, to, either to uh, explain the work we done by Water Resource Agency on land subsidence prevention and the adaptation strategy in Taiwan. Uh, first of all, on behalf of Water Resource Agency, uh, Director General Lai, I will want to welcome you to Taiwan because uh, Taiwan is a, a very beautiful island. It's a uh, Formosa. So Taiwan is so small, only uh, 36,000 kilometers square, but and uh, most area are mountains, and uh, we have very dense population. But we have very dynamic uh, economic. So we have uh, 101 Tower just uh, next door to <laughs> this building. You, if you have time, you can visit uh, the 101 Tower. And uh, we have many beautiful mountains. We, we have uh, over 200 mountains higher than 3,000 meters. Maybe you have time to jogging or hiking and uh, we have rivers. But under these uh, beautiful views, we have many natural disasters in Taiwan. And uh, as, as a previous speaker uh, discussed, uh, uh, we also have a, another very, very serious problem, land subsidence. It's, uh, actually, it's not a natural disaster his uh, water resource management problem, I think. Uh, why, what, what, how we, what, what do we do such that we have this problem, land subsidence problem? In Taiwan, we consider the hydrological conditions. We have very slope river, and uh, uh, only the, the longest uh, river is uh, Zhosui Creek. The water in the mountain just take 18 hours. The water will flow into the sea very quickly. And uh, uh, we don't have enough time to catch, to storage the water or to catch the water. So even we have so, uh, so annual precipitation is over two uh, 2,500 millimeter per year, but we have water shortage problem. Of course, we have flooding problem. <coughs> uh, the ge geological, we have very young uh, geological, so the geological weakness, and uh, we have uh, most of the wa groundwater resource is in the uh, uh, Lumia Plains on, the, on Taiwan west side. Uh, uh, as I, sh I talk about, uh, we, our river is short and steep, so the water is it's not easy to keep in the soil or, or in, on the ground. So you can see, uh, most of the pre most of the pre uh, precipitation, 66% will flow into the ocean. And, uh, only we we only have 4.5 percent water keep in the reservoir, and the, this water is the major water source in the dry season. So, if you don't have enough water in the dry season, what will you do? You will pump the pumping the water from the ground, and that's the reason we have the land subsidence problem. In the earlier age, who pump, the who pump in the water? 
industry. So in Taipei Metropolis, we have, he's the first one place we have the then subsidence, subsidence program. When we build the Feichui Reservoir, and the, when we construct the the uh, the old the 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 uh, uh, tap water supply system for the metropolis, and the, when the industry move out the Taipei city, then we don't the Taipei city will not don't have then subsidence anymore, but in under on the other, on, in another, in other place, we still have water shortage problem. So today, the land subsidence appears in alluvial plains, where always located in the water shortage area. Histor historical total land subsidence area is said, two thousand almost two thousand five hundred kilometers square. Historic maximum accumulated. Land subsidence reached 3.56 meter in Pintong County, in this county. And uh, now, uh, after the government efforts, we, c we control the, the land subsidence. So you can see in 2018, we observed land subsidence area only 400 kilometers per square, and the observed maximum annual subsidence rate is 6.6 .6 uh, centimeter in Yunlin County. But when the then sub subsidence occur, the ground label never come back again. This label is always under the water. So then subsidence, you can see along the Southwest uh, Taiwan Southwest shoreline, you can see many houses under the ground. That's a land subsidence problem. And uh, because uh, the land subsidence, so the, the drainage problem is huge. We, it's not easy to, to let the, the flood flow in, the flow in out. So you can see uh, the water level is so high and uh, the infrastructure is useless, functionless, okay. So uh, if the typhoon come in, you can see this uh, phenomenon very, very often. And the, 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 the area we call the, the stone inundation area, almost equal to the land subsidence area. And uh, even we invest so many money in flood protection dike, Damned, and everything we can do, but the problem cannot be solved today. Every time typhoon come visit this region, every time they were under the water. So you can you can ask that who are the criminal of the land subsidence? Maybe it's agriculture. Maybe it's aquaculture and the industry well. But the major problem is they don't have water to survive. They need the water to, for the rice, for the petty rice. They need the water for their industry use, usage. They need the water for agriculture, for their living. But the government do not supply enough water for them. So it's a big problem. Maybe we should, we need to figure out in the future how to redistribute our water resource more reasonable, reasonable to take care of this farmer uh, than the agriculture farmer. Okay, we government invest many project, invest many money and uh, many master plan. Year by year, we have many master plan. This master plan uh, can try to, uh, that's the next, next master plan, will try to increase the surface water supply and decrease the groundwater pumping. This, the next, uh, from the 2011 to 2020, you will find our, 
our goal is uh, our strategy is uh, uh, this four strategy one as I talk about and then the second one is groundwater restoration the third one is enhancing groundwater management the the, the last one is environment improvement in subsidence area we have many action plan try to do try to figure out this problem and the, our final target to keep the subsidence area uh, less than 225 year per kilometer. That means we still have this problem in Taiwan. Okay, you can see uh, the groundwater monitoring. We monitoring. We have we have many monitoring well, 800 and uh, almost 800, more than 800 wells in Taiwan. We monitor the water level, groundwater level. And uh, we have, uh, we also have the land subsidence monitor, uh, the, the sun, uh, some site, uh, you there labeling survey, we are sale recorded deep benchmark, and we are there the compassion monitor well. We have groundwater level monitor well, and the GPS station that cost them many money and a lot of money every year uh, and uh, we observe that uh, for the land supply and monitor results shows that the single inversion then always occur during the first season crop in the first season crop there's a there's a petty petty field and they in the in in the dry season in the dry season, the, the first, first season rice is best quantity and the quality. And the most important is more expensive. So the farmer loved the f not to plant rice during the first season crop. That's the dry season. They don't have enough water, especially when the water are distributed to the industry. They, the farmer, use pumping the, the well and they use the groundwater. So you can see the water level will, during this uh, uh, the dry season, the water level decrease very quickly. Uh, during the rain season, they are slightly a little rice, a little rice but next dry season try it more quickly so if we, if we can supply water to the farmer we we can stop such uh, uh, this uh, then start uh, then subsidence program so uh, we have we we do the many uh, groundwater regulation the groundwater regulation will review the with the hydrological condition and and and, and so on, and uh, generally we stop we try to stop farmer to use the well but use this, and uh, we you can see that we try to decrease the groundwater pumping, but I think is uh, is useless. <laughs> So we see the Yunlin County and the Zhonghua County sinking again. Okay. So uh, we try to decrease the, the, by reducing the agricultural water demand because the first season rice is so expensive. So no farmer try to change other crop or, or other 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 kind of so we, we, we don't have a very useful policy to stop them. And uh, we try to increase the surface water supply. So uh, we build the Husan Reservoir in Yunlin County. We hoped the Husan Reservoir was already complete uh, this year. We hoped this year we can reduce the then subsidence we can supply the water to industry and the domestic water you user and then 
and then the river water can be delivered to to irrigate it to the farm. Okay. So uh, and uh, we try to do groundwater recharge. You can see we have many artificial uh, artificial lake. This is in Pintong County, not in uh, Yunnan County. Okay. And uh, we have we try to enhance the riverbed percolation. We try to do that. Okay. And uh, we charge the water. Use the we try to change the water use behavior. Actually, it's very difficult. And uh, we have a li very little improvement. And uh, we try to change land use type. This the uh, recently we tried to uh, have the solar sonar. Uh, you see the 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 sonar uh, green energy, the prime. We 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 expect there will be something change, okay? So uh, we enhance the well management, but I I must speak honestly, it's a failure policy. <laughs> Nobody will give you information, let you control his well. Okay, we spend many money, and every farmer no say no. <laughs> Okay, and uh, we dream, we have uh, some monitor along the Taiwan High Speed Railway, and uh, remove the surface loading is very useful. Okay, and uh, we try to educational uh, pro uh, the, the the student, the local people, they are so happy and they uh, they participate in our activity, but they still pumping, and. Uh, we have successful in Taipei City, as I told in uh, in uh, previously, and the water level is increasing. But the the, the major reason is that we uh, supply the all the the tap water, and uh, the industry go out to Taipei City, and uh, we have uh, some uh, we call the success, successful uh, result, but. The more and the more professor did not do not agree our opinion. <laughs> we think we are successful, <laughs> but the professor Lin said WI is failure. <laughs> okay, now there's uh, some result. I I, I jump this slide uh, because uh, actually the area and the the, the land subsidence uh, maximum land subsidence is increasing, but do not stop. Okay, okay. So, uh, so we will still, we will still ongoing. We will uh, try to do smartly handle the groundwater situation, make western decision, eliminate the people's suspension, and uh, pay equal attention to development and the conservation and the stabilize water supplies. And uh, we will do so many things. We hoped. We can stop the landslide silence. If we succeed, I will say we have huge market in the world because in all over the world there are so many landslide silence problems we can solve, such as in Indonesia, Jakarta. I saw it's a very good, uh, good place. If we succeed, we can apply to the Indonesia freely. <laughs> okay, and uh, now this uh, we try to use the new technology, uh, technique to uh, to control the farmer use the the water you use use. Okay, and uh, we try to introduce new technology to transmit our our information and monitor uh, data, and uh, we will. Build more artificial lake, more detention pond, may use uh, more uh, river bed for the water cover. Okay, and uh, uh, we will uh, promote the freedom of prevention information to everybody to stop the behavior. It's difficult. Okay, and we will try to do. It's not an easy job. 
the the land suspension prevention occurred in Taiwan over 30 years. Nobody died for this problem. <laughs> but we are thinking, if you try to stop, don't let the Taiwan sink into the water, you must don't pump the water, pump in the water. You must follow the regulation. That's the only I can ask you to do as the farmer. Try to cooperate with the government. Thank you. Uh, is there a question? It's actually been many efforts have been done, but it's very difficult to change people's habit and also the agricultural behavior. <laughs> so it's, a, it's quite difficult. Uh, but uh, increased supply of the surface water is uh, definitely going to help. Yes. Actually, there is a... <laughs> uh, so uh, we are on time, you know. <laughs> I pro I keep my word prom my promise. <laughs> okay, thank you for your listening, and uh, we hope that we can. Uh, if you have any uh, idea about this issue, you may mail to me and uh, give me some information. We still uh, try to figure out this problem. <laughs> thank you. Okay, uh, we have a small gift. I'd like to thank all our uh, presenters for giving us a wonderful presentation and also thank you for coming to this session. And all of this uh, presentation with the agreement of the presenter will, be, will stay on the website. We have a, a webcast today, uh, a real-time web webcast today, and it's on a website and you can find the website uh, using the uh, 16 ARC conference site, and there is a link. And if the uh, presenter agree with the agreement of the presenter, they will remain on the website. And if those uh, did not agree to remain on the website, it will be gone by tomorrow. <laughs> okay, so you can still look at it today. Thank you for coming. Thank you.